Psalm 38 is where we are this morning, as you've heard. That's on page 492 of your Pew Bibles. A Psalm of David for Remembrance. Lord, do not punish me in your anger or discipline, discipline me in your wrath. For your arrows have sunk into me and your hand has pressed down on me. There is no soundness in my body because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have flooded over my head. They are a burden too heavy for me to bear. My wounds are foul and festering because of my foolishness. I am bent over and brought very low. All day long I go around in mourning. For my insides are full of burning pain and there is no soundness in my body. I am faint and severely crushed. I groan because of the anguish of my heart. Lord, my every desire is in front of you. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart races, my strength leaves me, and even the light of my eyes has faded. My loved ones and friends stand back from my affliction, and my relatives stand at a distance. Those who intend to kill me set traps, and those who want to harm me threaten to destroy me. They plot treachery all day long. I am like a deaf person, I do not hear. I am like a speechless person who does not open his mouth. I am like a man who does not hear and has no arguments in his mouth. For I put my hope in you, Lord. You will answer me, my Lord, my God. For I said, don't let them rejoice over me, those who are arrogant toward me when I stumble. For I am about to fall and my pain is constantly with me. So I confess my iniquity. I am anxious because of my sin. But my enemies are vigorous and powerful. Many hate me for no reason. Those who repay evil for good attack me for pursuing good. Lord, do not abandon me, my God. Do not be far from me. Hurry to help me, my Lord, my salvation. Tough read. Deep pain. A heart troubled deeply by its sin. A man feeling God's discipline for his sin, like an enormous weight resting on him. Maybe this psalm comes in the wake of David's sin with Bathsheba, but just as likely it doesn't. It could be after any sin David's committed, couldn't it? Whatever the sin is, David knows whatever the sin... David calls what he has done foolishness and sin and iniquity. He's in awful circumstances and he attributes those circumstances to God's discipline, to God's punishment and his indignation because of that sin. He's going through all sorts of pain, and that pain's physical and it's emotional and it's mental. And it conveys the depth of his pain poetically with all sorts of images, wounds and weight and drowning and lack of health and grief. And his pain is so severe it repels friends and loved ones and family. And then his enemies are there and they're encouraged by his pain. They want to harm him and trap him and kill him. And David is alone. There's no one he can turn to. He knows he's guilty. And that guilt and that pain are threatening to overwhelm him. So there's extreme distress. And David appeals to God in that distress. Let me pray. Father in heaven, much of life is painful. Um, 
Um, here is a prayer of a man in deep pain. We pray, Lord, that as we look at this today, you would, as we prayed earlier, teach us and correct us and rebuke us. And Father, we pray that we might know you better through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's look at verse 1 again. This, is a, this psalm's an appeal, and we're going to have a look at that appeal. Be, verse 1, Lord, do not punish me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Now that verse establishes the whole tone of the psalm. David is appealing to God's mercy. He's saying, please, Lord, be merciful. Please do not discipline me in your wrath. Do not rebuke me in your anger. All the descriptions of his pain and suffering that follow are David's attempt to get across to God how awful his situation is, how desperate he is. And he's giving this picture into his heart to let God know that he can't take much more. He's at the end of his resources. He needs God's help. Now, as we saw, David has no support from the other people from other people in his pain and suffering. His friends and his companions, they're avoiding him. His neighbours stay far away. Because his spirit is weighed down, just weighed down by God's rebuke and discipline, his, all the people that he loves want nothing to do with him. They offer no comfort. They desert him. They leave him in his misery. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there is a enemies and we meet them in verses 12, 16, 19 and 20 and they they set traps for him. They plot treachery all day long. They hate him for no reason and when he does them good they repay him with evil. They strive to harm and kill him and they'll rejoice when he falls. David is alone, exhausted, in terrible pain feeling God's hand heavy on him. He can't see help coming from any person. Now, verse 13 and 14 are one result of all this emotional and spiritual pain. I don't know if you've ever experienced a time of depression. I've personally known a few who've suffered this terrible affliction. Let me tell you, that the words of verses 13 and 14 reek of someone who is depressed. They reflect all those other verses of the weight of God's rebuke, how bowed down and heavy David feels. And in this depressed state of mind, David does not really hear the words of wisdom or comfort spoken to him. He remains silent, unable to speak of anything he's going through because it's just too painful. He doesn't want to talk about it. And it makes him alone in his suffering because he's ashamed, ashamed of his sin, ashamed of how he feels. It makes him awful company. Here is a man in a terrible state. All that is in this psalm. But it's equally important to look at what is not in this psalm. This psalm is not a complaint against God's discipline. What David says is, do not discipline me in your wrath. He does not say, Lord, do not discipline me. He, he says, do not punish me in your anger. He does not say, do not punish me. He does not try to argue he is innocent. On the contrary, he admits he is guilty. David does not suggest that God is being harsh in his discipline. Sure, he appeals for God to be merciful, but he does not suggest that the problem is with God and his discipline. David does not try to offer any excuses for what he's done. He does not try to justify his actions. He's not asking for God's correction to stop. He's asking for it to be less severe. As appeals go, it's not the sort of appeal you'd hear in a court, is it? Can you imagine going to a court 
and making an appeal based on these grounds. Your Honour, I'm guilty. The sentence I received is right and just. I just can't bear it. It's too painful. So, Judge, I'm asking you to be merciful. There's no legal basis in that appeal, is there? Not the sort of appeal that you would expect much success from. But David is not appealing to a judge in a human court. David is appealing to his Father in heaven. His appeal is the sort of appeal that a father, that a child makes to a merciful father. Let's have a look at the guts of David's appeal. All of David's description of his pain and suffering lead up to verse 15. David then presents his argument for mercy. For those of you following the outline, I'm up to point three. Verse 15. For I put my hope in you, Lord. You will answer me, my Lord, my God. The hope for David's appeal rests in what David knows about his father. He knows that his father will answer. David's not commanding God to answer when he says, you will answer me. He's making a confident statement about the father he knows. He knows that his appeal will really be listened to, really heard. It will not just be rejected out of hand. And he trusts God to answer so he can say, I put my hope in you, Lord, knowing that there will be an answer. In verse 15, David uses all three names for God, Jehovah, Adonai, and Elohim. And these names get increasingly personal. David knows his God personally. He doesn't just know of God. He doesn't just know about God. He knows God personally. He knows him just as a son knows his father. Through his life, David has been the beneficiary of so much grace and so much mercy from God. He is certain that God is not indifferent to his circumstances. He knows his mercy. He knows his grace. He knows his love. And so he brings all his pain and anguish to him. Then David lays out more of his appeal in verses 16, 17 and 18. David's appeal to God's nature. He uses a couple of more arguments. David's enemies are people who repay evil for good. They are people who set traps and plot treachery. They are people who hate for no reason. They are arrogant. They rejoice when their enemies fall. It is these enemies who will exalt themselves when David is brought down. So David's argument is, please God, do not let your enemies have that opportunity. Do not let them rejoice. They're God's enemies as well as David's enemies. And David's not far from falling. He is pleading, have mercy on me before my feet slip. Be merciful, Lord, so that I do not fall and give your enemies the opportunity to rejoice in my fall. And David's next argument is to remind God of how much pain he's in, which he's done, he's outlined his pain very forcefully. Even though he has confessed his iniquity, he remains anxious about his sin. This is not a man who confesses his sin and then takes the freely given ticket of God's grace lightly. This is a man whose sin troubles him deeply. If one of the purposes of God's discipline is to make us uncomfortable with our sin, then David is saying, your discipline's working, Lord. I do feel the weight. I do feel the guilt. 
David is at the end of his resources. His pain is ever with him. He may be getting to the point where he's beginning to doubt God's mercy or goodness, but he's not there yet. He's still putting his case before the God he knows personally and he's seeking his mercy and his goodness. He's being disciplined by the creator of the universe, the sustainer of all things, and David knows he has nowhere else to look for relief and help from his discipline. Lord, do not abandon me. My God, do not be far from me. Hurry to help me, my Lord, my salvation. In this psalm, we see a man attributing his awful, painful circumstances to God's punishment and discipline. What is our reaction to our sin? What is my reaction to my sin? Am I even thinking about what I am doing and whether it is sinful or not? Are we thinking about how we live and where the sin is in it? How much of the world's thinking have we taken on without knowing it? I read a book a while back about the state of Christianity in America. It used the term moralistic therapeutic deism. Now, lots of big words. Um, It used that term to describe what large numbers of people who call themselves Christian now believe. There is a God. He is a moral God. And he's something like Mr Fixit. I can call him whenever I have a problem. And he'll come and fix it. In this faith, not Christianity, God is not holy. There is no sin, therefore no righteous wrath against sin, therefore no requirement for sacrifice for my sin. So the true power of the cross just gets washed away. It's a strange Christianity where there's no confession or repentance required. I'm not saying that that's us. But how much have we drifted toward that thinking? How seriously do we take our sin? The cause of this psalm is a heart troubled by sin and the merited discipline of God that it is receiving. Our Heavenly Father still disciplines his children. How much do we think about God's discipline? David sees God's hand in his awful circumstances. He sees God is at work, disciplining, punishing him. Now, not all our painful circumstances are God's rebuke and discipline, but how often do we even think that they might be? The sinfulness of the world causes plenty of pain and suffering. But how often do we look carefully at how we live to see if there is something we need to confess, to repent of, and to put to death. Brothers and sisters, David appeals to his father because he knows he'll be heard, and he knows he'll be answered, and he knows that God is merciful. Do we bring all our pain and all our sinful folly to our Heavenly Father. Another thing David knows is that God knows his every desire and that every painful sigh he makes is before his Heavenly Father. Yet he still brings, even though he knows his Father knows that, he still brings his pain and suffering and his sin and his folly and his appeal for his mercy to that same father who knows all that. His father wants to hear him bring it. I 
I want to really look quickly at this psalm again from another perspective. This psalm has many similarities with Psalm 22. Now, we know Jesus spoke the words of Psalm 22 on the cross. Jesus might well have spoken these words at the same time as he bore his father's wrath against sin. Likewise, he might have spoken them in the Garden of Gethsemane as he prayed to his father. As far as I can find, the words of this psalm aren't quoted, aren't actually quoted in the New Testament. Yet the wounds, the brokenness, the weight of sin, the appeal not to discipline in wrath, the teetering on the brink of death, the being deserted by friends and family, the enemies that are working for his downfall, who mean him harm and will use any means to bring about that harm. All that is Jesus at the cross. But how could Jesus truthfully pray words that talk of his guilt and his sin and his iniquity? And in one way it's wrong to have Jesus speaking this way, but as Steve reminded us a couple of weeks ago, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, he made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus bore all our sin. He was our substitute on the cross. And God attributed all our sin to him. He bore all the punishment that a just God would inflict on us. Jesus may well have had these words to appeal that his father's punishment and discipline not be done in anger and wrath. And yet, the father did punish him, didn't he? But not beyond what he could bear. Christ may well have had these words with him in his mind in the Garden of Gethsemane as he sweat drops of blood, as he contemplated what was before him. In Matthew 26, when Jesus said to his closest disciples, my soul is very sorrowful, even under death. And then he prays to his father, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Psalm 38 may well have been on his mind. It is possible and true for David to write such a psalm because of the God we worship. David can use these words because God does listen. He does answer. He's concerned for his people and for the state of his children. So concerned that he gave himself in the Son so that we do not have to be punished as we deserve. Such a psalm is possible because of our Heavenly Father's mercy. And the cross is where the deepest, fullest measure of God's mercy is displayed. Even though the wrath of God against sin is immense, we sinners are not consumed immediately. So are we, the children of God, now free from discipline and punishment because the sins of the world have been borne by our Lord and Saviour? No. Many New Testament writers remind us that trials will come and that they are good for the children of God. Those trials are under our Father's hand, just as all other things are. When God disciplines his children, we know that what we are experiencing is minuscule compared to what we deserve from a just God. God's word has given us a little understanding of what we have escaped in addition. God's word gives us such great promises. Promises such as we heard in Hebrews 12 mean that when we look at what we now experience, we look with different eyes. God deals with us as sons. 
For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Now, did we deserve this? Should we be treated as sons by a holy, righteous God? David certainly knew the mercy and love of his heavenly father and so he knew he would, could make his appeal and be heard sorry, and treated with compassion. He also knew that he had nowhere else to go. Only God could give any relief from God's rebuke or discipline. The title of this psalm says, A Psalm of David to Bring Remembrance. What are we to remember? This psalm brings to the forefront of our minds that sin is an awful thing with a heavy cost. Christ bore what we could not bear and has rescued us from that eternal cost. We have been relieved from the worst of what our sins deserve. But our good Father does punish and discipline us for our sin now. Our sin is a serious thing with serious consequences. Paul says, What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our Heavenly Father can save us from our sin and its consequences and we must appeal to him. He's the only one who can answer. Let me pray. Father, we've been reminded this morning of sin and its weight. Lord, please keep us from forgetting. Help us to remember this. Help us to remember the price that was paid so that we might not bear what we could not bear. Father, thank you for your goodness and mercy and that we can appeal to you and that you will answer. In Jesus' name, amen.